Today's episode of the Cloudcast is sponsored by Datadog. Bring speed and scale to your security organization. Datadog Cloud Security Platform delivers real-time threat detection and continuous configuration audits across applications, hosts, containers, and cloud infrastructure. Built on top of the observability platform, Datadog brings unprecedented integration between security and DevOps aligned to shared organizational goals. As a listener to the Cloudcast, you can sign up for a free two-week trial to see for yourself how Datadog can elevate your cloud infrastructure security posture by visiting datadog.com slash security dash cloudcast. Sign up now and receive a free Datadog t-shirt. That's datadog.com slash security dash cloudcast. Cloudcast Media presents from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delp and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to the Cloudcast. We're coming to you live from our massive studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And we continue our look-ahead shows this week. Coming up after the news and the break, we've got a great look-ahead into FinOps and cost optimization. If you have listened to this show back around KubeCon, when we were talking about KubeCon and some of the sponsors and some of the interesting topics, uh, this was definitely something that was hot and continues to be hot. And so you will definitely want to stick around for that. In the meantime, I do have a couple news articles for this week. First of all, AWS has announced a massive investment into Virginia and the Virginia data centers. And AWS has always kind of had a sweet spot for Virginia. You know, it was the original data centers and um, a lot of the services always got implemented there first. And and they had announced they've already put in $35 billion and about 3,500 full-time employees in, uh, in and across the Virginia data centers. In addition to that, uh, the infamous HQ2, the second headquarters, was also announced in Virginia. And now they're announcing another $35 billion. This is another $35 billion in data centers, investments and services and infrastructure improvements between now and 2040. So it's really good to see that investment into that area and to see this continue. Moving on to our second article, and I feel like if you haven't already subscribed it to Cloudit Judgment Substack, you need to go do it because they make our news on a very regular basis. Fantastic article, once again, and really interesting read. But the part that was interesting to me in this particular one that was uh, linked is all about the upcoming economy in 2023 but also how we got here from 2020 to 2022 and how did we, so many companies went big during COVID. Why did they go big during COVID, especially SaaS based companies? Um, What was their thought process behind it? And then why is there belt tightening going on? And as they refer to it, a bit of a belt tightening double whammy. Uh, really interesting insight in this, uh, as well as all of the usual breakdown on a weekly basis that they do. For our third news article, Puppet. Remember Puppet? Um, past and current, a uh, great friend of the show. They were acquired by Perforce. I, I hope I'm saying that correctly, by the way. But what was interesting to me, they released, I just saw this linked in another article, a 2023 State of Platform Engineering Report. Yes, you heard that right. A Platform Engineering Report. It's the first one that I've seen so far. There's lots of states of DevOps reports and containers reports and all kinds of reports. This is the first one I've seen dedicated to platform engineering. I went and downloaded it. It's well put together. It's pretty lengthy. A um, lot of good data in there. They definitely spent some time on it. And if that is something that is interesting to you, or maybe you picked up an inter- interest in it based off, all, off of our look ahead show, then definitely go check that out. And so with that, I'm going to wrap up cloud news this week. And as I mentioned, coming up after the break, we have a look ahead for 2023 into FinOps with Matt Ray. It's our mission to give IT pros a break. So here it is. We 
wish it was longer. But to keep saving IT pros time and money, we only paid for a 30-second ad. From racks and PDUs to backup power, Eaton and TripLight have joined forces to bring more sanity to your day every day. Visit eaton.com slash audio today. And we're back. And, you know, Aaron, uh, going back a couple of weeks to our uh, our prediction show for 2023, one of yours was, um, you know, had to do with with uh, with FinOps and, and cost management. And you basically saying if you, you know, if you could if you could learn any skill kind of going forward, uh, you you want to be a, a, a cloud cost management guru. Is that still on your list for 2023? Yeah, absolutely. That that prediction has stood solid for a good three to four weeks now. Nothing, uh, nothing, <laughs> nothing has changed in that sense. Well, uh, that's a good thing because you are you are not yet a, a, a cloud cost guru. But today we actually uh, we get a chance to to not only bring on uh, kind of what I feel like as a friend of the show, although we we know all of his friends, we've never had him on the show, but also cloud cost guru. So really excited to have Matt Ray, who is uh, at CubeCost, uh, also one of the one of the trio at Software Defined Talk. You know, kind of what I feel like is, has become uh, our best friends in the podcasting game. But uh, Matt, coming to us all the way from Sydney, Australia, which I want to highlight one thing before Matt jumps on. Sydney, congratulations. You were uh, the number one listening city for uh, for any location for uh, for Cloudcast in 2022. So Matt, I don't know if that was entirely just you and, and your family and stuff. Or, uh, yep, yep. We're excited about that. So welcome to the show. Great to have you on. Uh, good good to be here. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I guess I don't think I'm single-handedly uh, raising the the cloudcast listening audience but uh been a fan for a long time it's great to be here um, and, so- and this is further proof though real quick too because when we had kubecon we had a running joke of like matt never saw brian brian never saw matt like we didn't know if everyone existed i i, I managed to keep everyone together and and got to see everyone but now everyone's yep. actually all on the same thread here all at the same time so <laughs> <laughs> yes finally together so give folks before before we dive into all this this new finops and cloud cost management stuff that that Aaron is fascinated with give us a little your a little bit about your background um I'm I'm fascinated you of of a lot of people that I follow on the internet you seem to be able to learn stuff faster than anybody and then go figure out and tinker around with it but give give folks kind of what what your formal background is and then what you're obviously what you're working on these days I don't know if I learn stuff fast I I can uh I, I had a, a boss a while back who gave me a valuable lesson. He said, make sure you can talk about anything for five minutes. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, you know, I, 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 I dabble uh, in, in a lot of stuff and, uh, you know, got a bit of curiosity. But, um, yeah, so, so my background is uh, I've been involved in open source since, let's just say, uh, the, the last century. <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know started uh while i was at uh, university of texas in the uh, the linux user group and you know got to meet uh richard stallman among other folks but uh you know um involved in linux early on and kind of just bounced around in you know different open source communities over the years uh, i did some monitoring i did some uh configuration management and you know a, a dabbled in a little serverless and now I've ended up at uh, KubeCost. And, um, you know, over the years I've, I've been in engineering and product and community. And now I'm, uh, the community manager for the open cost project, which is a CNCF sandbox project. Very that nice. Was, that awesome. was awesome. And we had, we had web, we had web Brown, who's, who's your, your guys CEO and founder on mm-hmm. back in July, uh, July, June or July of last year. So, you know, for folks that are interested as, as you, as you hear Matt talk, uh, you can go back and listen to that show as well. We'll put a link in the show notes. Yep. Cool. So Matt, let me ask you this. Um, I mean, gosh, cloud's been around 10 plus years or, uh, you know, definitely since, uh, oh gosh, what AWS reinvent was when, you know, Brian and I started really following everything. Right. And, but honestly, way back when it was, it was like, well, it's either cheaper or definitely cost management wasn't a very big topic, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) and, but it seems like it's really blown up these last couple of years. And, Mm -hmm. and is this combination of pandemic? Is this economy and interest rates? Is this, just end users are f- finally embracing the cloud and automating all the things and everything's running rampant. Like tell us a little bit about how we got here. Um, I, I think it's a, a maturation of the industry. Um, you know, p- pretty, pretty soon after, after, 
AWS, you know, started offering up uh, S3 and EC2, um, there were some cost uh, management tools. You know, um, the uh, Amazon's reports were rudimentary. Uh, you got the, uh, the the standard bill, which is a page long, and then you got the cost and usage report, which is, you know, I've seen them in the gigabytes range of JSON. So um, you needed somebody to understand what was going on. And uh, a lot of tools came into the space and, you know, there are, there have been a, a lot over the years and there's been, you know, some consolidation, um, you know, acquisitions and the like. Uh, but I think, I, I don't know if the pandemic really drove m much as much as just, you know, it's, it's become, um, it's become pretty ubiquitous to, to at least use the cloud and, um, you know, large enterprises have, have started to realize, like, we need to get a handle on what we're spending money on. And, you know, at first, you know, maybe this this short bill ended up in finance and they had no idea what was going on. And so, you know, they'd go to the engineering team and they you know, couldn't be bothered. And, uh, you know, other tools would come into the space and, you know, people kind of hashed. They're, they're still in this state. You know, they're kind of hashing about to find out what makes sense. Um and then in 20, I want to say 2019, uh, the FinOps Foundation was created. And it's a foundation under the, the Linux Foundation that uh, focuses on this intersection between finance and operations. And um, they had a conference right before COVID <laughs> and then took a few years off. And uh, last year, uh, they had their second conference, uh, the FinOps X conference in uh, uh, Austin, Texas. And um, I got to attend that and, you know, learn, learned a whole lot. And what the, the FinOps Foundation is doing is, is trying to uh, establish best practices. And, um, you know, I know like some people, you know, from the DevOps community, you know, uh, they get a, a little bit uh, bristly around best practices. But when it comes to FinOps, there actually are some. <laughs> so, um so you know the, they they've got uh, they've got some 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 guidelines and uh, you know what to think about what to look at and um, you know how to evolve your your understanding of what's happening financially in your cloud usage and so uh, it's it's a great resource if you haven't uh, checked it out yeah what <clears throat> you know as you, as you talk about those best practices um, you know we'll, we'll 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 link out to the stuff that the FinOps uh, community has built but like. You know, if you were to summarize those things for people, are they, you know, do they do they they build applications using good best practices? Has it have to do with like how often you're reporting things? I mean, like, you know, how do we get from the, you know, what what I how IT people think about stuff to you know how uh, you know kind of the the financial people think about stuff in terms of best practices? Like, how do how do you, you know where where do they go from? The, how do they, how do they sort of structure that? Because you've got two worlds, two languages, two things that people are, you know, getting measured on and stuff. Absolutely. So they, um, they present, uh, they've got a, a model of, of how to think about these things and it's kind of broken into different capabilities. You know, what, um, you know, what to, what to be measuring, what to look for, how to respond to it. And, you know, it, it's, you know, from optimization of, you know, your, the rate you're using it, the uh, the levels you're using it at, how your organization is uh, thinking about these things, how you're tracking them. And then at each of those kind of capabilities, uh, there are you know different um, uh, indicators you should be looking for. And you can start to kind of measure up like how well you think you're doing in each of those fields. And so they, you know, when when the FinOps folks talk about it, they, they talk about a, a, a crawl, walk, run, you know, so that you have this maturity model of, you know, each of the capabilities. So you can kind of think about this ongoing process for, for how you deal with understanding and, and reacting to your, your cloud bill. Um, because it's, unfortunately, it's not, there's no silver bullet in this at all. It is, um, it's a practice that you need to establish. Um, once you, once you know, once you start to care about your cloud bill, you probably need to start thinking about having you know a, a FinOps team, uh, even if it's not you know a dedicated team yet, but just people who are on top of this. And it's it's the intersection of finance and and development. And so you're going to have engineers talking to accountants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and and I 
we kind of have <laughs> been talking about the engineering side of this, you know, uh, over the years here on the podcast, but let's talk about the finance people side of this for a second. Um, and I just, I, I'm going through like my own experiences of like when I've had to deal with finance people internally in companies, and it's not always a pleasant experience at times, right? right? Because like they've, they've got one thing in mind, how do I make this smaller a lot of times, right? <laughs> and so like, mm -hmm. how do you get a finance person to like, understand nuances of all the services and like is you know something like this choice may impact the architecture or this this service may spike the bill or may not spike the bill like how do you go about bringing that finance and ed engineering education together to understand the impacts yeah that's a good question <laughs> uh the you know i so at the the finops x conference i actually did the um uh, the practitioner training, and we had a, a section where they asked people to self-identify: Are you, are you, you know, in engineering or are you finance? And it was about fifty-fifty. And then they had each team kind of write down words, you know, that are specific to your domain. And you know, there were definitely things from you know the engineering side when you know, I'm sure you guys have have been through this where you have to explain certain cloud terms to people outside the industry, you know, what, what, what is virtualization? What are, you know, what are VMs? What are cloud instances? What, what are reserved instances? You know, what, how, how, how do you get your head around all these things? You know, what is auto scale? <laughs> what is serverless? <laughs> and, you know, from the engineering side, you're like, Oh, you know, I got that. But then if you're coming from the finance side, you're going to come back with like, uh, you know, do you understand cop, uh, CapEx versus OpEx? Do you understand, you know, the way we do uh, depreciation of, of assets. And, you know, these are things that engineers don't care about. I mean, just in general, you know, as a general rule, they they don't really care about the finance side of things. Um, so you need to get these folks in the room um, and have, you know, the intermediary is probably going to be somebody like, you know, your CTO or, um, you know, CFO uh, who are, who are going to say like, you know, hey, you're spending too much on this. What can engineering do about it? Or, you know, finance says, we don't understand why this is so much, you know, is there, what, what, why is it this way? And maybe engineering, you know, hadn't taken the time to look at it, or maybe they have a good reason, you know, we're scaling these numbers up because Christmas is coming, we have to hit, you know, certain levels, it'll drop down in, in January, you know, don't worry about it. Um, but you need to have this, con uh, you know, constant dialogue between those teams because, you know, engineers left unchecked, well, they'll burn through a lot of money fast. And finance, if they got to rule everything, would, you know, turn everything off. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 there's there's part of me that's that's in, envisioning the, the conversation in office space where they go, Bob, what do you do around here? And he goes, I take the requirements from from this group to that group. And they're like, yeah, I don't know about that. I, I do wonder, you know, when you get into especially. I, you know, and I think about, you know, some of the interactions I have with finance where they want to talk about things in ratios. So I can imagine they're going, okay, well, you know, we want to know like the, you know, the click to cash ratio, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. how many, how many of these things. And you're going, dude, I, my, you know, the reason all this stuff is on the bill is because I'm trying to build, you know, four nines of reliability. Like I'm not thinking about clicks. I'm not thinking about the revenue. I'm thinking about this and, I, and, you know, you get weird situations where, you know, they have certain metrics and, and ratios and things in mind. And, and you're, you know, you're sort of working on something that you're like, I'm making something as good as I possibly can, but it doesn't, it's not going to show up in your thing. And I don't know how to, you know, how to rationalize those two things. And I imagine there's probably, probably a lot of those conversations because, uh, you know, whether you're worried about revenue or whether you're worried about cost are two very different things to accounting people. But to technologists, it's like, oh, I'm worried about, you know, throughput or delay or availability or something. And, and you know, it, it is, it feels like it's probably like a constant just translation all the time. Yeah. Well, ideally, somewhere inside your business, you should be able to identify the numbers that your business thinks about. You know, the, you know, the, the unit economics of, you know, hey, we're selling this many widgets or making this many reservations. And, you know, that's something that, you know, the business side of it understands, you know, where you can say our business is making these, selling those, what have you. And engineering can wrap their minds around, well, 
that number goes down if this happens or what do you know what what are we doing to to move that number one way or another um and just like everything else you can start to track that and you know, if you if you can agree upon you know the those unit economics for for the business well then hopefully you can come to some sort of agreement to you know do we do we need five nights you know maybe maybe you don't you know maybe you're southwest airlines um yeah <laughs> but um you know, but but if you can agree on those numbers, then you can start to make concessions in certain areas. And and you know, sometimes sometimes you know you're going to actually end up spending more money. You know, hey, we we actually need to make these numbers go faster. Um, and finance, you know, they they can be, they're not they're not always the people saying no. You know, it used to be operations says no, then people started blaming finance. People are going to say yes if you're making the business more money. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How do you how do you how do you find you know teams put together these these FinOps teams? I mean, is it is it sort of grassroots? Is it is it the first time the bill shows up and and somebody freaks out? Like how you know how, how have you seen things evolve? What are what are some common mistakes? What are some you know kind of good things you've seen people do? Um, I, I, I've seen everything. <laughs> so before, uh, before I, I switched over to being the open cost community manager, I was a, a technical success manager. And so I was dealing with, you know, the, the folks using our product and inevitably um, it would be someone pretty technical. I mean, you know, Coop cost is a uh, Kubernetes cost management. So we're already kind of in the deep end of, of the technical pool, but um, a lot of the, a lot of the times, you know, it was, an engineering manager or a team leader or director who had been given the mandate of like, we need to know, we need visibility. And, um, you know, some of them were parts of larger initiatives where, you know, they had standing meetings with finance and they were taking those, the numbers out of the tools and, and pushing them into, you know, you know, BI tools like crystal reports or, you know, Tableau or what have you. Um, you know, so, so definitely you see, some some people are are more at the enterprise end where you know there is a finance team who you know has a, a regular cadence of reviewing these things and and others were just engineering that you know smaller startups that um this became another dashboard you know they were looking at cost anomalies they wanted to see how fast things were being spent um and that that's an easy feedback loop to start looking for optimizations too so uh you know, there's not one size that fits all, but what we're trying to do at at KubeCost and especially with OpenCost is like turn this on by default. You know, I mean, with OpenCost, it's a CNCF project, so the goal there is to just if you're running Kubernetes in the cloud, you're going to use OpenCost so you see your numbers. You know, just so you know, because a lot of people just don't know what that is, and, and you can't wait a month for your bill. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. So. And I do want to dig into open cost, but one final uh, thought on on resources and teams. Um, and it almost seems to me like, okay, yeah, one of those keys is being able to be an expert in one area and then be able to translate that into the other area, right? Like you got the engineering side translated into finance or understand what it means in finance and vice versa. But does that almost seem like, okay there's a high barrier to entry to this of like, cause you need to be an, an expert in one area to be able to translate to the others. Like how does somebody newer get started in something like this or can they get started yeah. in something like this? Cause now you got to learn two sides at once, right? Well, you don't have to become an expert in both sides. That's, mm-hmm. that's, you have to be open to, you know, having the conversation and learning something. Um, you know, as I mentioned, when, when we had that training session and they, you know, they broke the two teams then it became a matter of, you know, okay, you wrote down serverless, now explain it to your mom, right? <laughs> and um, that that can be a challenge. Uh, but, you know, the, the finance people, you know, they're, they're not dumb. They're just smart in a very different field from engineering. And so, you know, they're usually the people, the people signing up for the FinOps work are interested in the other side. And so there's, you know, curiosity of how this stuff comes together. Um, and there's, there's really a lot of great educational resources. I mean, there, there is a, you know, there's a cloud FinOps book. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's called cloud FinOps from O'Reilly. Um, it's by a lot of the folks in the FinOps, uh, foundation, um, a new versions, I think coming out in March, but, um, that's a great resource. It, it just kind of goes through all the basics and gets you up to speed on things. 
but it's it's an ongoing there's no there's no one size fits all and it's going to be a journey for everyone who who you know embarks on this but you can't ignore it so that's kind of the the problem so just like we have devops days where everyone you know starts sharing their war stories you know maybe someday we'll have finops days and uh you know everyone will get together and and talk about uh the processes and the people instead of the tools <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about about uh, about open cost. Um, so, you know, give us a, give us a sense of, uh, you know, what is it? How old? How mature is it? You know, who's who's involved with it? All those sort of things. Sure. So, so open cost is a CNCF uh, sandbox project. So it started. Um, it was unveiled in June uh, of last year, and what it is is a specification and an implementation of how to do uh, real-time uh, cost monitoring of Kubernetes. You know, in, in a nutshell, that's the current current uh, scope of, of what it does. And so the specification was hashed out by, you know, folks from KubeCost and AWS and Red Hat and Google and a couple others. And it just talks about how we actually measure these numbers. You know, what what is idle? What is, you know, how do you split a workload on a you know, an EC2 node that's running between different namespaces. Um, and so the specification is is a good reference for understanding how we actually measure these numbers. And then the implementation uh, was kind of, it was the, the, the core engine of the KubeCost commercial product. And so it, it it's not new. Um, it, it's been around for, you know, three or four years. And it, it was open source prior to um, being contributed to the CNCF. So uh, it's got, you know, dozens of contributors uh, already. And it, uh, if you are running, you know, on AWS or Azure GCP, um, even on premises, you can just uh, turn it on and start uh, getting numbers uh, that, that reflect the uh, on-demand pricing for your uh, Kubernetes deployment. So it, it's going to talk to, um, you know, the, the Kubernetes APIs, um, Kubernetes, uh, the metrics, um, it's going to, you know, it, and then it just writes stuff out to Prometheus. So it's, it's pretty, pretty simple and, and, you know, it, it's scope of what it does, but, um, a lot of people don't have any visibility. And so, you know, then you take, you take that, it's, it's got a UI or you can, you know, pump the numbers into, uh, you know, Grafana or your favorite dashboard tool and, uh, start seeing where your money's going. And, and if somebody does, you know, whether it's cube cost or open cost, um, turns everything on. What what are some of the things they typically find first, or what's some of the most enlightening things? What they you know the the typical things of like, oh wow, I did not expect that. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think what usually happens is people have over provisioned their instances. So. Um, you know, when you deploy a, a workload uh, on Kubernetes, you can specify like how much CPU, how much memory you want, um, you know, how how GPUs and the like. And generally, uh, that's not being consumed. And so, what we show, um, what we show in the UI and through the the KubeCuddle um, CLI is is you can see you know the idle, and the idle is usually a lot higher than people expect. Um, most of, you know when I was working on the the commercial side of things, most of the customers they were using less than ten percent of what they had allocated, and and so the easy wins of course are well turn stuff off you know maybe you've got too many nodes running your Kubernetes cluster, um, but then also go back and check you know what you're specifying um, your requirements are you know maybe you've got an nginx node that you said it needs you know two gigabytes of RAM, and you know it actually needs like 128 <laughs> megabytes. Um, you know, so you see a lot of that. Um, you definitely see, uh, you know, orphaned workloads, things that are just kind of running, but not receiving any network traffic. Uh, you know, the, the KubeCost UI has a lot of optimization recommendations where it, you know, generates these reports of, of, of you know, where, where you're spending your money and not, you know, actually doing anything with it. Um, but you know, with with open cost, you can find you can find those numbers and the the idle number to most people, you know, within within you know two or three hours of turning it on, you can start 
you know, bumping that number from, you know, less than 10% to, you know, 20 or 30% utilization. And, and, and in some cases there actually are rationales for having a lot of, you know, uh, uh, unused capacity, you know, maybe you've got really spiky workloads and, you know, you got to keep it below certain percentiles, but most uh, organizations have a lot of workloads and they're, you know, they just over allocated. And so you can quickly knock a lot of EC2 off the budget um, that way. Yeah. Uh, makes, makes sense. I I'm, I'm curious as you've, have you've gotten more into this? I mean, you've you've got a background. You know, when you were you were a chef for a long time, so you were involved with all sorts of things. But you you got into different application patterns, and and you've seen you know big ugly applications and small microservices. Like, do you feel like having that background of really kind of understanding what architecture looks like and those things has has helped you, or do you feel like? Uh, you know, this is a this is an area that that you know most sort of technologists can kind of pick up because you know if you can if you can work your way through spreadsheets and you can do math, it's just you know it's another way of dealing. It's like how, how much does really understanding the applications apply, or can you kind of just apply the best practices? Um, actually, I, I think the best practices are are pretty good. I mean, I I definitely saw a lot of crazy stuff uh, in my days at, at Chef, and um, but but what I've seen uh, on the KubeCow side is, you know, first off, I'd almost never seen multi-cloud in the wild, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which I, I mean, you know, and, and, you know, it's probably a, a selection bias of the customers of KubeCost, um, but we've got a lot of multi-cloud customers. And I think, you know, Kubernetes enables that, you know, it, it makes it easy to migrate your workloads between different clouds ostensibly. And, you know, so I, I have seen customers across, you know, three, four, you know, public clouds even, um, and on-premises. And and so that was, that was an eye-opening thing. But what, what hadn't changed is you see a lot of enterprise applications that have been moved repeatedly, you know, from, you know, physical hardware to virtualization to containers into Kubernetes and they haven't really been re-architected, which, but it doesn't matter because, you know, they've got un, well understood usage patterns. And so, um, you know, a lot of people aren't really phased when they see like, oh, we've got 60 applications running in our enterprise. And, you know, these 30 are, they're chewing up a lot of, you know, they're over allocated, but, you know, we could probably fix them and nobody really blinks an eye because they've been running them for years. <laughs> and so it's, it's okay to, you know, turn the knobs down on those things. Um, which, which is, which is good. Nice. Nice. Well, so Matt, let me kind of close out with this then. So again, we're calling this kind of our, our, our look ahead show. What is, you know, take out your, your crystal ball for a second. What are some areas for cloud cost management that is either interesting to you personally, or you think is going to be an uh, an upcoming trend in twenty twenty three. Um, so I definitely think, uh, yeah, I'm I'm a skeptic of of the phrase AI, but uh, ML is actually where it's at. Uh, you know, machine learning um, makes a lot of sense for some of these workloads. Uh, you know, sometimes it's just fancy algorithms, but you know, if you start looking at usage patterns. Um, you can automate a lot of the sizing of, of these workloads on Kubernetes. Um, it's, it's less, it, it's, uh, it's slightly more scientific on Kubernetes than it is, you know, with a bunch of VMs um, because, you know, they, they've got APIs, you can dynamically adjust these things. And so I, I think, um, I think uh, that's going to be an active area of, of uh, development and engineering is just dynamically resizing workloads based off of, you know, utilization and and using ML or you know, algorithms to uh, you know observe those patterns. I, I think that's going to be uh, really useful. Um, and th and that's something that you know, OpenCost is just an observa uh, observ uh, <laughs> observ <laughs> a monitoring tool. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's a monitoring tool, it's right? Nagios. It, it's Nagios. Yeah, it, it, it's it's Nagios for your Kubernetes costs, and you know, so it, it's it's providing that data, and what you do with that data is kind of the next step. And so, uh, definitely seeing people, you know, taking that, feeding into you know bigger models, 
Um, KubeCost does the same. You know, other folks are, are welcome to use OpenCost uh, to do it. Um, you know, we're just trying to standardize how how you monitor that stuff. And um, I, you know, I think in the, the you know the upcoming year for for OpenCost, you know, it's it's a new project um, that you know already has a lot of capabilities. But uh, we're you know hopefully we're going to be expanding into um, off cluster resources. You know, so. You know, your Kubernetes cluster is using RDS. You know, how do you measure that? It's using S3 buckets or, you know, it's using Cloud Query. You know, we, we want to be able to track that too. And so I think that's something that is likely to be uh, on the radar for, for open cost for 2023. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, Matt, uh, thank you for everything, man. It's like, like we love we love having folks who've been coming on these these look-ahead shows. I think uh, the, the uptake from people has been really good, but it, it allows us to take a, a big topic, kind of dive into it, dig dig into it, and then you know, kind of hopefully give people a sense of of where it's going to go in in uh, in twenty twenty three. So, uh, any any good resources, uh, you know, that that as you were getting started in this, you you recommend to people or you know recommend to our audience uh, in this space. Uh, I mean, if you're new to FinOps, you know, start at finops.org and the O'Reilly book. That's the one two punch for most folks. Um, you know, if uh, if if you want to get a hold of me, yeah, I'm happy to to talk through things. Um, I'm I'm a talker, so uh, <laughs> uh, always happy to chat, especially if it's about open cost. Good stuff, good stuff. Aaron, you want to wrap it up and take us home? Yep, absolutely. So, Matt, thank you very much for your time, and uh, on behalf of Brian and myself, thanks everyone for listening. Um, also. If you're enjoying the show, please uh, leave us a review. Please tell a friend. And uh, that is it for this week's Look Ahead show. Oh, oh, and we one will last talk- thing. Oh, one please, last thing. Matt, go, go, go. Yeah, go. yeah, yeah. If uh, if you like talking to to me, or if you want to talk to Brian and Aaron, um, they're hanging out over in the Software Defined Talk Slack. So <laughs> yeah, uh, we good. we do have a Cloudcast channel over there. Yeah. Um, you know, come uh, come hang out with us over at Software Defined Talk and uh, catch up with Aaron and Brian there. Oh yeah, that's right. Absolutely. And I, and it's funny too. I, I will openly say this. Uh, I've, I've mentioned more than once on the, on the cloud news that we do every week because uh, yeah, I tend to, I tend to pull some links from there and, uh, yeah, we all do. definitely great discussions and, and, and way to stay on top of everything. So yeah, it definitely invite everyone over there. Uh, so <laughs> thank you for that, Matt. That was fantastic. Um, so with that, I'm going to close it out. Thanks everyone for listening this week and we will talk to everyone next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 